One of the aspects of the psyche is its layered nature. And one can think of a tree, which starts out in its first year with a single ring. And in the second year, it develops another ring. And in the third year, another ring. So that when you cut a tree that's 150 years old, you can count its age by the rings. Now, if a tree is developing in the first year and then in the second year, and then is injured, snapped, uh, scraped too much by a deer, it will have a deformity. And as the next layer comes along in the following year, it will also have a deformity. And so at a moment of shock or when the pattern is interrupted, an imprint from the outer environment uh, touches the pattern, traumatizes the pattern, interrupts it. And from that moment forth, the tree grows on, but with a record of that scarring, of that break or, or impact. And the human psyche is no different. We come into the world, assuming a healthy body, uh, with a very liquid and symmetrical energy. Uh, it's incredible the potential of a child to learn any language, to learn to eat any diet, to learn to say hello in any number of different ways, whether through bowing or handshaking. The child enters as a circle. But every environment puts different pressures, has different taboos, has different memes. And those show up as a punishment and a reward cycle. Because a child is dependent on its outer environment for its needs. Every human being in the history of humanity needs to survive, needs to feel secure in that survival. And there are a hierarchy of, of needs. This is from the work of Abraham Maslow. There's a hierarchy of needs where first you need to survive or layer three in your hierarchy of needs, love and belonging, doesn't really matter if you're dead. And so there's a hierarchy. First survive, then feel secure, then seek love and belonging. Now an infant, a child, to some extent an adolescent, depends on the giants around them to meet their human needs. Uh, a parent with a single blow can end the life of a child, with a single decision can uh, traumatize or protect a child. And so every child is naturally very engrossed in the giants around them wanting to understand the facial expressions, the tones. Before language, a child is noticing the, the physiology, the emotionality, the raising voice, the intensity, the, uh, the roughness in the movement. You know, someone who's you know, very upset cannot be delicate. So if a very upset person takes, lifts up a child, they're going to be more rough. And because a child is so small, and a grown-up is so big, relatively speaking. Every one of these little impacts reverberates at 500% more intensity than it would if you were a grown person. You may see you know, an angry, brooding person who grabs your hand a little bit harder than you'd like and shakes it without really making eye contact and makes you a little bit uneasy. But this can terrify uh, an infant uh, simply because uh, of the law of mass, which dictates that the bigger an energy pattern is relative to another energy pattern, uh, 
the more impact is possible. And so the more important it is to understand and anticipate. And this is particularly the case when a child has been repeatedly traumatized, when they've had their energy pattern, which is their identity, uh, shattered by much larger uh, energy patterns that can easily jeopardize a child's existence and certainly their ability to meet their needs because they don't have the mass to, quote, hold their own ground. To If there's a collision between a pinball and a bowling ball, the pinball goes flying, the bowling ball continues. Now, this system of rewards and punishments causes the circle to adapt. It may become more of a half circle. It, 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 it may get incredibly elongated into something like this. And as the sphere, which is the most graceful shape in the universe, as the sphere distorts in, in various ways, it becomes more of a bumpy ride. The most graceful process is a circle. And that's why we use circles and spheres for tires uh, on vehicles. We could use, quite easily, we could bolt triangles onto cars and have four triangles. Just imagine how bumpy that would be to have four triangles going at 70 miles an hour and all the jostling that would occur as cars raising and falling and how it slide off the road. It's a very bumpy ride. And so it's known as the fall from grace, the fall from the innocence of the circle, the innocence of the one, into the knowledge of good and evil, the cutting of the one in half. Because what the knowledge of good and evil is basically is you, you take the one and polarize it, number one. And number two, you say that half of it is good and this other half is bad. And then you create a war between the good and the bad, which is the equivalent of your united team doing something. And you divide the team into two equal parts. And then you get a rope and a, say, let's have a tug of war. And now all that energy that was moving forward is now uh, pulling against itself. You've got a battle within the psyche uh, in this fight between the good and the bad uh, that is uh, created in human consciousness and language. So within this paradigm of, of growing up, and rings. One of the things that I have been interested in for some time is understanding how the wound, the wound of fear, the wound of pain, that I've spent a good chunk of my energy my entire life feeling, developing, and processing, how did it emerge? Because you You've heard of positive synergies. You know, you think of compound interest, for example, where you know you you make an investment, it goes up. You reinvest it, it goes up again. Uh, you make interest on the higher and higher capital. The capital goes up faster and faster, and so you've got this this cycle going up. But there's also negative synergies, which you can see in the wound. There's evolution and there's devolution. It depends on the perspective you're looking at. If you're looking at from the perspective of the wound, it's growth, right? Um, if you look at it from the perspective of the tree cutter, it's progress as each tree is cut down. But if you look at it from the perspective of the ecology, of the ecological whole, it is a regression as each tree is removed uh, and clear-cut. And, and so there's 
There is a growth of the wound. And you can see this physically when if you cut your finger and nobody attends to it or acknowledges it, first of all, you lose blood. That's step number one. Secondly, if you don't attend to it, wash it, tend and dress the wound, the wound becomes infected. Now, you've got an infection at the same time you're more tired. You're tired because you've lost blood and you've had to cope with the pain of being cut. And now you're in a tired state as your immune system tries to handle the infection, but because you're not responding to the wound, the wound deteriorates. You may reach a point where you then need to be amputated. Now, if you amputate, now you have a new wound because you, you now have, you can't you know, hold things in the same way with two hands. You've, you've got an amputation. And if you don't address and understand the impact of the amputation, then you start dropping things. If nobody recognizes that you're an amputee and they throw you a ball and you keep dropping it, they may get mad at you because you're more incompetent as a result of the wound. But it's important to understand that while in, with the bias on the individual, which is an aspect of, of the Western cult, which is, you know, because which do you focus on? In a polarity, you have the circle, the, the one, or the individual. Who's to say? Well, Western cults focus on the individual. And so if you drop the ball because your hand was amputated, because you cut yourself or were cut and nobody dressed the wound, the focus is on the individual. Why, why did you drop the ball? Or why did you cut your finger? Why did you do this? But it's equally valid. And it's important for the symmetry of perspective to look the other way and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The individual is a refraction of the probability field of the whole. You don't just get someone speaking spinach in a Japanese country. They speak Japanese. Why don't they speak spinach? Because that's not how the psyche works. The science of the psyche says that as the whole refracts into unique individuals, each individual holds part of the whole's pattern, perhaps combining them in different ways, but you don't just get a monkey growing out of two people uh, or a brand new animal that we've never seen before, speaking a new language, eating different diets. No, there's a tremendous amount of replication. And so when a person, one, cuts themselves or is cut, number one, and two, no one around them dresses the wound because they lack the competency to do so. And the person born into an incompetent dynamic doesn't dress the wound because they haven't learned to. We're not actually talking about an individual. We're talking at a, about a level of cult stupidity, of cult ignorance, of cult failure. The root word of culture is cult because so much of culture is the unconscious repetition of the norm going off perpendicular to intelligence. So intelligence, the efficiency with which time, money, and natural resources is transformed to sustainable well-being is taking us up here. But the cult isn't interested in data, isn't interested in the science of well-being. The cult is interested in repeating the norm. The cult is primarily interested in being normal copying the norm as closely as possible, regardless of how intelligent that norm may or may not be. And so 
the individual, if they do not care about themselves, is a reflection of a cult that doesn't care about itself, statistically speaking. You don't get everyone in the cult caring deeply and meaningfully and about themselves and treating themselves with a great deal of respect, but then suddenly out of nowhere comes one person that doesn't value themselves, doesn't value others enough to, to take care of oneself. Because to not value oneself is also not to value others. If I say, well, I don't matter, my body doesn't matter, my heart doesn't matter, and I don't take care of my heart, mind, and body, and don't learn things, and don't grow, well then, when I interact with the cult, I do so as an incompetent, untrained, ignorant person. Which means that what I'm really saying is nobody else matters either. Because if they mattered, I would have cleaned my act up enough to learn how to do things well for them. And so there, there's really this, this, this close symmetry between the pattern of the individual and the pattern of the cult. To say I don't care about myself when living in an interdependent cult where I drive on the same roads as everyone else, if I let my car just drive into another car because I don't care about myself. I'm also saying I don't care about other people. And so there's, there's, there's a connection here. And so the person who allows a wound to deteriorate and then is punished for that by an incompetent cult that didn't prevent the wound, didn't dress the wound, didn't teach the prevention and dressing of the wound to its people, and then didn't teach the consequences of not dressing the wound, and then doesn't grasp that the wound has occurred. It takes a certain amount of blinders to look at someone with an amp amputated hand and not grasp that they can't catch a ball. But psychologically speaking, and we start with physical because in a materialistic cult such as our own, we get these things physically for the most part. For the most part, we get these things. Not always. Like, you don't know that my ear has been tingling for the last week after a tick bite. You don't know, and you wouldn't ask what's going on physiologically and listen to an answer because that's not part of the cult. So, but you, you would probably notice, you know, if my arm was amputated. However, in a psychologically illiterate cult, if you've been severely traumatized and nobody witnessed the actual event, then you may or may not know what's going on. And you don't have the protocols in a, so, uh, in, a, in a psychologically ignorant cult to do something about it. And what I'm interested in is the layers of the psychological wound that I've participated in, inherited from both parental, uh, you know, family systems, which of course inherited it from the larger cult of America and, you know, the various generations back and, you know, the immigrants. Because it's important to understand that psychological wounds also deteriorate without attention and continue to adapt in ways that in a psychologically illiterate circle of people you wouldn't know how one thing led to another. And in a don't ask, don't tell cult, nobody is going to volunteer the information and nobody's going to ask. And so everyone remains completely ignorant. And when the pressure is to be normal, regardless of how intelligent normal is, then you don't get the encouragement, the, the food, the example, to examine these patterns oneself. So I've been aware that this pattern existed, but this morning when I woke up, there was a line of, you know, of a pattern, there was a pattern in front of me that I could follow. And so 
I sat down for an hour and I wrote out the pattern. Where did it begin and how did it mutate and mutate? How has my wound emerged? How did it present itself and how has it grown? And so it's it's like layers of a tree. Now if you understand that this is not my wound per se, meaning I didn't invent all of this uh, structure. It's, it's a process of you know, this circle, which is a certain statistical, you know, we, we all come in with this possibility of grace and symmetry, and then it's dinged up in different ways. And so, um, you know, the, the first thing that I saw, and I had to go back to around one year old to, to see this, was radiant presence. So there's this radiant presence and a sense of self and a sense of connection with self and a sense of love. Uh, and, you know, this is a beautiful feeling. So, you know, that's where consciousness starts. Now, I talked with my mother and, you know, um, among other things, you know, she, she mentioned that, you know, there was a time around age two or three when she flew into a rage that she didn't understand, just kind of swept over her. She was filled with rage and she hurled me onto the floor uh, as two or three year old, you know, and, and so she's a giant at that stage, you know, she's, you know, three to 500% bigger, heavier, taller. And she's my primary source of survival and security and love and belonging. And there was, I, you know, I understand my mother fell off her bicycle as a pregnant woman and, you know, landed on her belly. So there's some, you know, impact in something like that, but this would probably be more traumatic. Um, the next kind of layer, the first layer of the wound, the wound as I experience it is shock, overwhelm, shame at being hit and being unable to move. So that's the first thing that I'm conscious of. I don't remember the bicycle accident in the womb. I don't psychologically remember. My body is in fear and anxiety, but psychologically I don't remember being thrown to the ground. But shock, overwhelm, shame at being hit. I remember being hit, whether it's my ear pulled or being spanked or being paddled or being whipped or being hit, slapped or hit. I remember being hit and being unable to move the paralysis and the shame of it. And in that shame, you know, where, and shame is the transference of, in this case, inadequacy. You know, you, you have basically an inadequate couple of parents and in, an, in a cult that says basically that anyone over the age of 18 can have children, whether they have received a single hour of competent parenting in their life, whether they are an addict, whether they have intergenerational abuse. Because you can look at certain people at age 18, 20, 25, 30, or their entire life. You can look at them. And if you know anything about psychology, you know anything about probabilities and statistics, mathematics, you can say there's a 99% chance that you are severely going to harm your child. But go ahead and have a, have a child anyway. You won't receive any support and neither will the child. And this is a, a staggering reality that we exist in that cult, the cult that will enable and protect the right of a completely incompetent, highly abusive, possibly and probably addicted, whether it's addicted to amphetamines 
or addicted to anxiety or addicted to not feeling anything. Because both of my parents' primary addiction, uh, aside from power and power dynamics and stuff, were to not feeling anything deeply. Their deepest need, I would say, is not to feel things deeply, not to acknowledge deep feelings, not to be present in their body and be vulnerable in feelings, which creates a huge imbalance because for the child, they are completely in their feelings. They don't have the luxury of dissociation at that early age, number one. They need to get into their feelings in order to learn emotional and physiological regulation. But also, the child cannot kill the parent. The parent can kill the child in a heartbeat. The child, so you've got a tremendous power imbalance. Now, if you add to that imbalance, the parent doesn't want to feel things deeply and be present in their body, you, the parent becomes more sociopathic. The infant, the child cannot. And so whenever you have massive inversion or massive, massively unbalanced power dynamics, it tends to be conducive to abuse. And this is why intergenerational abuse is more common from parent to child than from peer to peer. Now, you would think you love your children more than you love your peers, so why wouldn't you abuse your peers more than your child? It's because the power dynamic isn't there. The child is completely and utterly dependent. So being shocked, being unable to move, feeling the shame of inadequacy and fear. So this is the first layer where the circle is, is starting to... Uh, where the circle is, is starting to distort. So it was like this, but now it's distorting. And then we have the fact, you know, for a child to experience trauma, grief, shame, is a crisis. It's a crisis of identity. It's a very different identity than the innate sense of blessing and value that we come in, that radiance of, you know, that newly born. There's no question about value in every infant. It, they, they know and feel, I knew and felt, valuable. But being traumatized, being abused by the people I dependent on, and then be, not having that trauma repaired, not attending to the child, attending, you know, as narcissists do to themselves, created the feeling of loneliness when no one responded. See, for a child, it doesn't necessarily have to be the parent that responds to trauma, shame, and pain. But when no one responded, every child takes it on to be about them. So no one responded. Now, part of this was my parents' protocol of isolation, relative isolation, living out in the wilderness, in nature. Um, there wasn't anyone there. This wasn't a busy street. This was, you know, an isolated home in the forest. So when no one responds there, it, it elevates to a high level of trauma because it's, it's creating this high level of terror and pain, calling out for help, but no help is coming. So, the, so the, the level of fear and pain is naturally projected into the future. If you're in pain and you ask someone to stop and they don't stop, your brain naturally connects the dots and say, there's that in the past, there's this in the present, it's going to be in the future. And I can't do anything about it because I can't stop it in the present, so I can't stop it in the future, and I don't have help. I don't have help, a feeling of helplessness. Helplessness is a necessary ingredient for trauma 
It's also a necessary ingredient for hate. If you are and feel and understand your power, you cannot feel hate. Helplessness is a requirement for hate as well as trauma. And an infant that is isolated in an abusive dynamic uh, will always feel helpless, and so I did. Uh, now, as thought began to form, so we're starting to five-year-old, six-year-old, you know, starting to question, seven-year-old, a little bit, develop some reason. The thought forms is, I deserve to be punished. So, you know, in a, in a child or dynamic with a parent or in an individual that's being picked on in a group, whenever you have one mass that is in tension with a much bigger mass, the law of mass, if there's a tension, comes into play. And the law of mass says that when the pinball is, is, is collided with by a bowling ball, the pinball goes flying. Now that creates anxiety. When you understand that you're in conflict with your provider protector, and you're the one that's going to go flying, and they are sociopathic because at the moment of your deepest pain, they laugh, send you to your room, turn away, don't respond. You're dealing with a codependent relationship, or at least you are completely dependent on them. You're in high levels of pain, and they are sociopathic, and so they're not responding to the high levels of pain. Well, this creates tremendous anxiety. Um, and what, what children do to gain a sense of control in this anxiety is they internalize the, the abuser's incompetence. So the parent is sociopathic. The child is not. So this plus will be symbolized sociopathic, but what the child does is because it's too upsetting, if you're five years old and you say, you know what? My complete and utter life depends on a sociopathic reptile who will do and not do anything that they want to do to feel better at my expense. And there's nothing I can do about it. And if I protest, I will be hit. I will be shamed. I will be beaten. So rather than say, wow, I've got 10 more years or you know, 15 more years of, of depending on a reptile who's incompetent and who's cruel, and I could die at any point, and there's nothing I can do about it, the child deletes the sociopathic awareness of the other, of the parent, and puts it into themselves. And they say, I'm bad. I deserve to be punished. And so that's my next wound, is the internalization. I deserve to be punished. I'm wrong. I'm bad. So there's a very important layer as reason starts to develop in a traumatic terrain where I'm being traumatically abused by people in a sociopathic state, in isolation that I depend on, in a state where I cannot bond successfully with either parent because they don't want to be emotionally vulnerable with themselves, with each other, or with me. I'm already needy. You see, when you take a person, you and I need oxygen every single minute of every single day. Now I look very relaxed. You're probably watching, if you're watching this video, you're probably very relaxed. I don't need anyone, you say. Well, just block off the oxygen supply. All the trees and plants that are giving you a ready supply of oxygen on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, just cut that off. 
and let's watch you for the next 20 minutes. Not too long, only 20 minutes. Let's cut off your supply of something you desperately need in order to survive, to have a chance of being secure. You cut that off. And then let's watch what you do. Now, if your oxygen is cut off and you have no control, you will instantly go into high. First of all, all your attention will be on the deficit, the threat to your life, number one. Number two, you will panic. You, you understand there's a time frame here. If you don't solve this problem, you will be dead. Now, if there's a giant 30 feet tall holding down your windpipe, cutting off your air, you may completely despair because you can't get a 30-foot giant off of your body. And that's the size of a parent relative to a child and infant. And so you're going to start squirming. Now, if a, if a sociopath looks at you, well, that guy's a problem. Look at him squirm. It's so irritating. We're trying to watch TV, right? Now, a competent human being wouldn't do that. They'd get the oxygen off and understand that you're flailing around, your tantrums, all of that are related to being oxygen starved. And if you were brain dead for the rest of your life in terms of, you know, a little bit funny and couldn't really grasp things, the, the anger if it, in a competent uh, situation would be directed at the parent. How could you starve your child of oxygen for four minutes? And now you're hitting them because they're not washing the dishes fast enough? You realize you're the cause of that, right? But in a, in a highly incompetent, ignorant cult, there's no awareness of patterns. There's no awareness that there's, you know, if your grandfather has PTSD, your father probably has PTSD. There's no awareness, it's like, what a novel idea. Um, there's no awareness that if a bullet is aiming at your head at 200 miles an hour, it was probably aiming a few feet before your head in the same direction at 200. You can follow the direction back, but you have to have some competency around these patterns and, and flows before you can empathize with reality as opposed to the, the blindness of a psychologically ignorant cult, of a traumatically ignorant cult. You know, we don't teach our parents, we don't teach our children, we don't teach our teachers, and we don't even teach our therapists in many cases how to respond competently to trauma. I know as a therapeutic abuse survivor, um, so trauma hits in. So from this point on, we have hyperactivity, anxiety. There's a feeling of scarcity, of dread, because I may be faced again with an overwhelming pattern of fear for which I will be blamed, but not get helped by. So that's the next level. The, uh, and I deserve it, and I'm, and I'm wrong. Um, out of the wound of, you know, the thought wound of I deserve it and I'm wrong, and the loneliness of emotional disconnection and isolation, and the isolation induced by parents choosing to live off in the forest, etc., rather than in a close community, etc., out of that isolation and trauma in the belief that I deserve it, I made myself available to be hit by my parents. Now this, this wound showed up several times later. So the first thing is not running away, making myself available to be hurt and traumatized by my parents, having decided they're right and I'm wrong, they're good and I'm bad, trusting them and not myself, 
I make myself open to be harmed. Now, this is a really important pattern because like all patterns, you know, as you continue to grow, they, they echo the pattern to some degree. So I had a Waldorf teacher at age 11. And one of the interesting things, this happened in two different levels. So this, this hyperactivity and anxiety from trauma is then uh, punished by teachers and parents. Why? Because it's, hot, it's difficult. That's why I brought up the, the, the analogy of the amputation. It's difficult. You know, if you throw the ball to someone and every time they drop it and you don't understand the reason, there's going to be some irritation and patient. You want them to catch the ball. If someone is anxious and fidgeting and you're trying to be connect and be you know, have them be still, it's going to be irritating, right? So once you induce a child into trauma and into PTSD, their functioning, their coping mechanism for dealing with that amount of pain alone, that amount of fear alone, is going to be difficult for the people around. And in some ways, it's fair play. I mean, if you as a cult want to grant the unequivocal right of sociopathic, reptilian, traumatized, narcissistic, and incompetent parents, which describes a very large percentage of parents to varying degrees. If you want to say, okay, fine, go ahead. Have lots of kids, whatever you want to do to your kids. Well, as long as it's behind closed doors and we don't have to know about it, just go and do it. I mean, any person with a brain looking at the statistics of abuse of the grown-ups, if you ask, you know, where you hit and look at the statistics, anyone with a brain knows that that's going on in your neighborhood. But as long as it's not happening, so the cult unleashes the sociopathic incompetence of the cult onto the infants who are going to show scars of the cult. And those scars, the amputation, psychological and otherwise, are not going to make it easy for the cult. But a sociopathic narcissistic cult doesn't grow out of empathy for the child. They grow out of outrage at their narcissistic absorption being interrupted. So the parent causes the harm, but then is affected by the harm they cause as well. And for a narcissist, that's the point when they get upset. They're not upset by the harm they cause. They're, they're upset when it bounces back at them. Because the more you abuse a child, you more, the more you disable the child. And then the more anyone close to the child, including the parent, is going to deal with that disability. Because we're in an ecological framework. We're not actually isolated individuals. The child would not have developed those symptoms of abuse if they were not abused. And the parent would not suffer from the symptoms of the abuse if they didn't abuse their child. And the teachers wouldn't suffer the coping mechanisms of the child if the parent didn't abuse their child. And the spouse of the abused child growing up wouldn't suffer the ripple effects of childhood abuse if they hadn't been abused in childhood. In an ecological framework, everyone is affected by the incompetence or the, the competence of everyone else. It ripples out as, as impact. And it's in, in an intelligent cult. You measure that impact and stop and interrupt the patterns of abuse that provide very little value to the cult and cause enormous chronic harm for decades, which is what we do when we induce complex PTSD in our children, do nothing about it, and then 
unleash them on the world for the next, you know, seven decades. So this pattern of knowing that I'm bad and I deserve to be punished shows up in kindergarten when my godmother sends me into the basement to be eaten by witches for fidgeting. And I go into the basement to be eaten by witches, a story that when you have no TV, no radio, and you're in an isolated cult is believable, particularly you know, if you have your caregivers and your Old Testament God and deity behaving sociopathically and barbarically to an innocent child. Is it hard to believe that there are witches in the dark that will eat you? But of course, this adds to the terror, which adds to the fidgeting, which then adds to the punishment and shaming by an incompetent teacher. Well, you know, 11 years old, I'm apparently fidgeting too much for the French teacher at the Waldorf school that I'm attending at that point, at that point in England. Well, she doesn't like the fidgeting. So she tells me to put my hand in the desk, and then she slams the desk down on my hand and told me not to move, and I didn't move. Now, why would you move if you're bad and wrong and deserve to be punished? Now, her defense against childhood abuse in a private school that's all about, you know, these flowery ideals and stuff, was that she expected me to move my hands. She told me to leave them there and that she was going to slam the desk down. But she expected me to disobey her, which was why she was punishing me in the first place, because she had told me not to fidget. But to someone who's trying to avoid and process this chronic sense of terror, that is as ridiculous uh, as you know, telling a tree not to blow in the wind. I mean, you have to stop the terror, which means you have to stop the parental abuse cycle, which means you have to acknowledge intergenerational abuse, but that's not being taught at school. So it's, it's this constant transference of the incompetence of the cult and the older onto the smaller. Now, this same program, I deserve to be punished. I have to do what I'm told. Uh, when I had a back spasm, now, why did I have a back spasm? You know, uh, because I'm constantly anxious, because I'm constantly expecting to be punished to be hit for doing it wrong, for not doing it good enough. So why do I, because I can't let my back relax and feel safe, because it feels like I'll be dead, because I don't know what that feels like, because that fear was before language. It's my identity, it's my pattern of thinking, feeling. That fear kept me alive, watching, and worrying about the behavior of the giants around me. So I have back spasms and I can't work. I cannot work. I'm laying on the floor and if I move more than an inch or so, I'm in absolute pain. Now, I'm anxious because I know I deserve to be punished if I do it wrong. And a bank loan is due. $250 is due for an installment on my truck loan. And I can't move. And I can't go to the job site and get the final check. I can't finish the last few days of work on the landscape project because of the back spasm. And I can't let go of the back spasm because of the terror. But also because of the terror, I'm afraid of being punished, of not being able to please the client, but also 
the bank. And I remember a phone call with Whidbey Island Bank, you know, and, and you know, bl bless a few banks for having a little bit of humanity. But I was explaining to the bank manager, I, I said, I'm laying on the floor, I can't move. I've got $300 in the bank uh, in my account, but I don't know when I'll be able to get off the floor. And if I pay you this $300, I won't have any money for food. Do you want me to pay you or should I buy some food? You And one has to understand this from the perspective of the five-year-old that deserves to be punished in order to understand why, as a 23-year-old, if the bank had said the right thing to do is to pay your loan uh, and starve yourself, that I would have done that. I mean, this was a conundrum, like, how do I meet my obligations and still eat if there's not enough money? And how can I work if, if I move my back even an inch, I'll be in more pain, and if I ruin my back, I'll never be able to finish the job and give you the money I owe you. I've got to take some care of myself, or I won't be able to pay you the money that I owe you. We all know you're the important one, whether it's the bank or the client or the parent. But I'm at my limit. I can't, I've got to take some care of myself. Or, you know, what about if I starve to death, what about next month, right? And so th this is the scar of that wound. It's not a circle of value, a circle of authenticity. It's the scar of that wound. And there were no people crying for the lost innocence, the lost humanity. No one was weeping when, as a three-year-old, my parents were enraged. Nobody was weeping when I was constantly anxious and fidgeting. No one was weeping around the terror clenched in my back for decades. They might have been, it's a shame the job wasn't finished or that, you know, he sabotages this and that or the other. This, oh, what a, you know, what a pity that he does that to himself is the idea of a narcissistic, chauvinistic cult that focuses the entire fractal pattern of the cult dynamic onto the individual for the sole purpose of not having to respond. I don't have to respond and help this poor you know, person on their back or whatever, because he's doing it to himself. He shouldn't have been born to sociopathic parents. He should have taught them at age three how to treat him. He should have learned about trauma in a cult that doesn't talk about it. In fact, that shames him for having feelings. He should have, he should have, he should have. He did it wrong, and he deserves to be punished. And as soon as they say that, my five-year-old says, yes, I did it wrong. I deserve to be punished for the incompetence of the entire cult. It's called scapegoating. It doesn't work any more now than it worked back in the day when someone invented the idea of taking a random goat throwing rocks at it, tormenting it, and driving it out of the village. You know, does it make you feel better that you terrorized a goat and now you have one less goat in your flock? Apparently, that's what scapegoating is. You can never intelligently blame an entire calamity. We do it with Hitler as well. This is the larger scale. Does anyone want to look at Hitler's parenting? His rejection from art school? All the women who laughed at him when he expressed interest in them? Anyone want to look at what his 
nature was before he was severely shamed and abused? What about his addiction and anxiety and mental state that he didn't get any help for? They just gave him cocaine in the war, right? You know, as he'd go into all kinds of ways of processing his terror and paranoia, they'd just give him cocaine to give him a, a sense of confidence and so that he could perform for what? For the cult. Germany needed him. Did it have anything to do with the rest of the world, not understanding psychology, not doing anything about it? No, 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 no. Let's blame it all on one person who's bad and deserves to be hated and punished so that the rest of us who are colluding with the incompetence, who are participating at an equal level of incompetence, can all tisk 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 and pretend it's got nothing to do with us. To cover the fact that if we say maybe it does have something to do with us, we don't know what to do in an incompetent cult that hasn't developed models for responding to this thing. So here's this pattern developing that's not shifting decade after decade that if someone says that I'm bad and I deserve to be punished, I immediately feel five years old and agree with them. I deserve to be punished. And the only way around that is to be perfect. And so we develop then a veneer that is based on sheer terror. I have got to be perfect. You know, I feel this panic if I'm three minutes late for a meeting. Suddenly I'm driving like 70 miles an hour. Why? Because if I arrive three minutes late for the meeting, I deserve to be punished. And no one will help me when I am punished. And I will be all alone and ashamed in the worst feelings of my life. And everyone around me will pretend like it's no big deal. And I will tell myself I deserve it because that's what got me through at age four and age five and age six. And no, you know, this is kind of one of the reasons I'm talking about this publicly. I've done $140,000 of therapy with 40 different practitioners and not one of them asked the questions or listened to the answers to reveal this pattern that I'm talking about here. Everything that I'm sharing with you has never come up or even close to coming up. I could do another $100,000 of therapy with these 40 practitioners, and this would never come up. So why is it that the single most important patterns to understand do not get understood by the client or the therapist in therapy. And of course, it gets shame shunted back to the individual. If, you know, if I start talking about how terrified I am, everyone around me will say, well, go see a therapist. Go, go, yeah, go, go, get out of here. Don't make us listen to the reality of our cult incompetence. Please do not reveal this pattern. Go pay someone who's never going to talk about it in public. But so which therapist should I see? Well, I'm, I, see this one, see, but, but that therapist isn't helping me. Well, then you must be doing it wrong, right? So it goes back to the individual. Just as long as we don't have to deal with it is the narcissistic and somewhat chauvinistic attitude to, to shunt the group pattern onto the scapegoat. Now, the more I make myself available to be punished, and the more my parents punish me, the more helpless, the more crazy I feel. This is one part of me deteriorating into PTSD, and then there's another part, led by my parents, saying that this is for my own good. It's for your own good. 
we, we're a great parent. So you have insanity emerging between the parent's chosen view of themselves and parenting and the underlying data of reality. However, the underlying data of reality doesn't decide how much to whip you, doesn't decide how much to feed you, doesn't decide how much to pull your ear, doesn't decide how much to shout at you or blame you. The parent does. In that situation, the psyche of the child, the intelligent mode of the child is to go crazy to side with the parent. I will ignore the data and I'll side with the parents. That way we're more in attunement. So now we're both crazy. So insanity is one of the memes that is intergenerational. Very, very common for a child to be insane in the same areas of their parent, just as it's very common for a cult member to be insane in the same area of their cult. You know, you ask an American, how many hours of competent parental training do you intend to get before having your child? Now, an American will look at you as if you're nuts. What do you mean? Oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. I mean, I'll just, just do it in the normal way. I mean, because they're in an insane cult that has been granting parents the unequivocal right to abuse, shame, and traumatize their children for hundreds of years. So what, what's, what's the problem? So I went insane with my parents, deviating from reality. Now, when you abandon yourself to believe the abuse, shame dynamics of your parents, when you abandon reality and data to listen to soothe the parents in their need for insanity. You know, they need to avoid the guilt. They need to avoid the stress of dealing with reality, the reality that they don't know what they're doing. So then they need to reward their child for going insane with them and pretending that they know what they're doing. Like when my father took me out of the sack from dragging me up and down the stairs and around the house, these are great, liberal, caring parents who donate to nonprofit, who run a nonprofit, who buy all organic, only the best vegetarian organic food for our children, because we want them healthy and alert for when we hit them, shame them, play abandonment games, and drag them around in a sack. So when, when I get out from the sack, I think it was a laundry bag, Dad asks, how was it? Right? How was it to be dragged up and down the sack at, you know, at age four? Oh, it was great, Dad. Wonderful. Thanks for including me in some area of your life. Thanks for not abandoning me in these horrible feelings alone. I'll put up with a lot to have some company. But how much do I have to lie? How much of my circle, the part that I came in with, do I have to obscure in order to fit into the little sliver of reality that dad finds acceptable and wants to play with? Because I desperately need connection. Now, this feeling of desperately needing connection is the same feeling of desperately needing oxygen. Just cover your mouth and watch the intensity of your desperation. Now, if you're in a cult that shames you for being desperate and needy, like ours, you've got a problem because your giant is covering your mouth and you're squirming around trying to breathe but you're in a cult that then hits you for fidgeting, for squirming around. And if you say, hey, this is hurting me, then you're a bad kid because you're talking back to your cult leader, your parent. So do you want to be bad for dying, 
You know, you'd probably be bad for that too. You wretched kid, why did you die, right? Um, but when you dissociate emotionally and shame emotions in a human being, a human being needs love and belonging. When that need is not met, when it is met with a whip rather than with love and belonging, the same desperate neediness emerges healthily in any human being who is shamed and beaten in the arena of their psyche they need intimacy and love. Now the cult is ready for this. It understands that there is a large percentage of its young infants and children who are malnourished, traumatized, raped, bullied, and in various ways deprived of love, safety, and belonging. And it's common sense that the more you starve oxygen, something you really need, the more you will seek it desperately. That the more it is erratically withdrawn and threatened, you know, if you have a mother that says, I'm leaving and I'm never coming home, or plays a little abandonment game out in the forest and walks away, right, and hides until the child bursts into tears for being all alone. Realizing it. every child and infant knows they cannot survive alone because they can't, because they're in touch with reality. Well, we've created a cult that, per that says that needy men and women are disgusting. So we'll withhold your needs so that you become insecure and needy. And then when you express insecurity and need, we will shame you and disown you. So it would be kind of like, you know, you're running out of oxygen and you're desperately gesturing at your tank, please, I need oxygen, I need oxygen. And the response is, well, I would have given you oxygen, I would have, but you're too needy. I don't enjoy giving oxygen to people who are desperate for oxygen. So go away or learn the tried and true technique of dissociating from who you are and pretending to be confident, cool, and collected so that I can feel comfortable and give you the oxygen that you need, but are pretending that you don't need, because the banks do the same uh, thing. You go to a bank and you say, I desperately need $100,000. The bank says, why? Well, my husband has lost his job because of his back injury. So first there's the back injury, that's generated $100,000 of medical bill, and then he doesn't have his income, so he can't pay it back. And we've got to pay our mortgage. And we're at 90% loan to value. Now, I'm taking a leave of absence that's unpaid. This is what a reptilian cult will do to a, a, a people. We're not going to pay you for taking care of your husband at a critical time. No, no, no. How does it benefit us? We're, 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 we're narcissists, right? It's not going to, you know, how am I going to get my bonus, right? So you tell the bank, just how desperately you need the money. And the bank person says, well, thank you very much for your candor. And thank you for helping me understand just how much you need the money. I get it. Unfortunately, people who actually need money are high risk. So we're not going to loan you any money precisely because you need the money. But, do visit us again in the future. If you get out and you're still alive and your husband hasn't committed suicide for watching your go homeless and all of this, if you come out of this in one piece and you both get your jobs and you do not need a loan, we would love 
to give you a loan at that time in the future. And a good capitalist cult member is supposed to say, well, of course, the bank is protecting their shareholders. Is doing a good job for the shareholders. And, you know, we're, we're not human beings. We're capitalists. And the most important people to protect are the people who do not need protection, the shareholders, because the employees really need protection. They're working for a living. The shareholders have money to spare. They're investing to get rich. A shareholder doesn't need money for rent. If they do, they don't buy shares. The shareholders, by definition, are the wealthiest people in the capitalist cult. So naturally, in a sociopathic cult where the small and vulnerable are used and exploited, whether as children, as students, as employees, by the more powerful, it is, of course, we would destroy a family to protect the shareholders. And this is the price of the reptilian brain. You cannot stay in these reptilian protocols and stay deeply connected to your humanity because the empathic brain, your human brain, screams out, no, this is wrong. The shareholder's jobs is to protect the customer. The government's job is to protect the people, not use the people to stay in power, to protect the politician. The core program here is this tension between the reptilian brain and the empathic brain. So you have the reptile and you have the human being. They're both there. They're both available. The empathic brain says, who's in the most pain? How can I help? The reptilian brain says, what is the most expedient way to fight, flight, freeze, and fawn that will enable me, regardless of how it affects other people, to get more of whatever it is that I need or want. The reptile exploits need and dissociates from other people's pain. The empath prioritizes and looks at who's in the most pain and how can I help? So banks, reptilian. Many of the grown-ups in their relationship with children are reptilian, particularly when you consider the lack of empathy for the enormous underlying imbalance of power that's there in a child. When a child complains about their parent in this cult to another family or a teacher or even a child psychologist, my experience as that child is of being coached and guilt-tripped for saying anything negative about my parents so that I could make the therapist, the parent, more comfortable with their incompetency to intervene, with their unwillingness to help a vulnerable child. And the way they smooth over that is by painting the picture, by telling me how wonderful my parents are, rather than listening to how I'm feeling about being abused and about watching my siblings be abused and about watching my parents abuse one another. You can listen and help a child, or you can shame and lecture a child on why it's their fault and why you're not going to help. Because that's the reason that every grown-up walks away. I'm not going to help. I'm going to walk away after delivering my lecture. The implication is, 
It's the child's fault. So the more I make myself available to be punished, the more helpless and crazy I feel. I'm asked to go crazy to protect my abuser. Now, I split here between life is bad and the world is crazy and sadness at the failure of, you know, to, to, to respond. Because as I continue to grow up watching these patterns, I can no longer deny the level of cruelty and incompetency around me. I start to see more of it, particularly as I watch my younger siblings go through the same abuse cycle. I realize it's not their fault. As a babysitter, you see, my parents abused my siblings and I, and my siblings and I responded in the way that my parents needed. My parents had a primary need not to feel anything deeply. And their strategy for doing that was to create lots of distraction and their strategy from their feelings and their strategy for doing that. And they also wanted to punish and blame each other because neither of them were an adult. They were both in grown bodies, but they didn't know what to do to solve their own emotional crises. And so, they blamed each other. They were looking for a parent. My dad wanted my mother to be a mother. But she wasn't a mother to us. How could she be a mother to him? My mother wanted my father to be a prince charming and make things right. But how could he do that when he was in his own fear, pain, agony, and trauma? So they both kind of tried to blame and punish each other through the children. You know, Michael would come to me and say, your mother did this. You know, and he, as a six-year-old emotional boy, wanted me, as a 12-year-old son, to go fix what my mother had done. And the emphasis is always on dissociatively disowning and scapegoating. That's why it's your mother which blames the child for being born rather than my wife, which would blame the husband for picking the person who they hate so much, which has more competence. You know, a 26-year-old who could pick from a variety of different people and picked Sherilyn, or an infant who has no known method of picking their parents. But this is rationality. We're in the domain of rationality. But parents are in the, the, realm, the realm of blame and insanity. And so your mother did this. So I'm supposed to, oh, gee, I'm so sorry, Dad. You know, you know, I've really got to get it together with my mother, right? What am I going to do? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You're going to have to figure it out. It's your mother, right? And of course, Sherilyn would do the same thing. Your father said this. Oh, don't get me started on your father. Of course, if she said, don't let, get me started on my husband, she, she might put the focus on her choice of mate, her choice to have kids, her choice to not work, her choice to uh, look to an incompetent person to fix her problems and, you know, wonder what, but that would be healthy. And so many of our parents are not. And why would they be when they're in an unhealthy cult? Where if the president of the United States makes a tremendous mistake, the expectation is that someone beneath them who made no mistakes will resign to protect the reputation of the incompetent 
figurehead at the top. And that members of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a team and of a government would only be considered if they would willingly sacrifice their own careers to protect the person who would appoint them, who may be far more incompetent than they are. We all understand, right? So-and-so resigned so that the president could say he had no knowledge of it. Why? Because if the person just came out and said, bullshit, I saw the president who appointed me say this, 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 and this, and I had nothing to do with it, and I protested in the, in the backdoor meeting, and I was told to shut up or I'd be fired. And you see, in the United States, run largely by reptilian brains, there would be hatred towards this, it would be a man, of course. Well, at least now we're letting some women come into junior positions, but the, uh, the party, the party of the person who told the truth about their leader's incompetence wouldn't turn at their leader and say, you fucking moron. We believe in this, not this. We're here to serve the people, not this. We got into politics to help the people. Now, they would turn on the, quote, whistleblower for not being loyal, for not covering up the incompetence of the leader and being a good sport and taking the fall for the family. And where do you learn that? Where does that become so obvious that something that crazy is normal. You learn it when at home, if you make mom and dad look bad or whatever, you get hit even if you just told the truth. Mom, if it's so bad that you said this, then don't say it. Don't punish me for telling someone what you said. Is the problem with the truth or is the problem with what you said? And if the problem is with the truth, where's all the double speak? Why are you telling me not to lie to you? Particularly if you punish me for telling the truth. So you have all this insanity that gets offloaded. Now, there's a tremendous sadness around this incompetence. So there's grief. There's sadness, and also the walls are closing in because no one is advocating for the child as this entire pain dynamic escalates, as the wound deteriorates. No one's advocating for the child. No one's saying, Dane, how can I help you survive the incompetence of your parents, of your cult, of your, of your teachers, etc." They're empathizing with my parents about how difficult it is to be a parent. And admittedly, having children in a state of ignorance and incompetence in an intergenerational abuse dynamic is difficult. So why do it before you learn the ropes? Or why do it at all? You know what? We don't have a clue what we're doing. You know, you don't go out and build a house and say, you know, we've never hammered a nail. We've never cut a piece of wood. We never designed anything. I think we'll build a house. It's the natural thing to do. Um, and the, the, ironically, the government won't let you. If you don't build a house properly, you don't get an occupancy permit. You don't get a permit. You, your house gets torn down. However, if you get pregnant, high on crack cocaine, with intergenerational shame and violence, with a history of PTSD in your family, have at it. It's only an innocent child. Now, a house has got to be done right. But a soul, a psyche, eh, it'll figure it out, right? It's a stunning level of cruelty and ignorance 
because those priorities do not line up with intelligence. So as I observe my sadness and my raging, blaming criticism, see, because what's happening is this part of me is saying I deserve to be punished and is colluding with the giants that want to punish me. And then this part of me, which gets no support, is getting desperate, is terrified of going crazy, is terrified of the trauma, is terrified of the pain, and is trying to tell this guy, don't do it. Don't go along with the punishment. And this guy is saying, no, mom and dad, this cult, this parents, they know what they're doing. I'm bad. I'm a good boy because I'm choosing to be punished. So this part gets more and more critical and enraged because this part has a lot of the vote because it's backed by the grown-ups. Now, as I observe my sadness and my raging, blaming criticism, which is kind of the response to this, I feel unlovable and sink into despair. Because I try to advocate for me, hey, fight, fight, you know, don't go along with this. You're not deserving of being hit. But the other part of me is saying, no, 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 I am. And you're not wanted here. The protector is not wanted. Because it wasn't wanted by my parents, because it wasn't wanted by my cult. And so I sink into despair. As no one's protecting me, and as I try to protect myself, other parts of myself are loyal to the abuse, so I sink into despair and feel unlovable. Now, as I sink into despair, I don't want to look anymore at myself at the future, and I look for addiction instead. Because when the tie-breaking vote is held by this guy and the parent, and the cult behind the parent. There's no chance of winning that battle. If you really, really believe in something and you've got 5% of the vote and the vote's gonna be decided by the 50% majority, it's absolutely pointless. And so I know that I'm not going to avoid punishment, unless I can be perfect, because I'm going to go along with being punished. And people want to punish me. So despair, absolute despair, <sighs> pain, frustration. I don't want to be here in my body. I don't want to be here. How do I avoid it? I have to Find some distraction, some loop, some little tunnel thing to go round and round and round and round. A compulsion is a, a distraction. It's a loop. Its main purpose is to get out of the absolute misery of the reality of the moment, of the despair that even I won't fight for not being punished. Now, as I move into addiction, anxious thoughts are addictive. So we have anxious thoughts. Um, well, it's, it's this, you know, so we've got anxious thoughts. We've got sweets. We've got control and manipulation. Uh, we have watching media. We have talking. We have fidgeting. We have being, being hyperactive. These are all compulsive, addictive energies to try and stop being present with the absolute despair of letting somebody hit me and feeling absolutely small, unlovable, and helpless. It's too much for a child to deal with. As I lose touch with reality, with dreams, with myself and any hope, I feel disgusted. 
I feel disgusted with myself for going along with it. I feel disgusted with my parents for hurting me. I feel disgusted and dissatisfied with a cult It'll be so hypocritical because you know you're talking you know to Waldorf teachers and it's all about the child and the parents are all about, but no one's fighting for the actual felt experience of the child. They're fighting and having a campaign to make sure that you're wearing a hundred percent natural wool. Give me a fucking polyester sweater any day of the week, and parents that don't hit their children. But that would be too intelligent. And it's also harder because my parents have gotten no more training than I have on how to be a competent parent. So why would they do it? How could they possibly be a competent parent in a cult like ours? So learning, you know, being given the task to be a competent empathic parent, forget it. But the, the task of going from synthetic fabrics to natural fabrics, well, we could, I'm sure we can do that in a materialistic cult where everything can be bought. Sure. We'll fight for that instead. I feel disgusted, violent, hopeless, despair, and You know, just just, just uh, uh, suicidal by age fourteen. There's no way out. There's no way out, and now I have to sit and watch the same thing going on with my siblings. And you know, when a bunch of kids are induced into all kinds of acting out to enable my parents to, basically, the children were asked to be my parents' distraction from their feelings that they didn't know how to deal with. And so my parents would reward each of the siblings differently for acting out differently. And so nobody wanted to be a babysitter for my siblings because the siblings assumed that all the grown-ups needed them to act out for some way or reason or other because they would be rewarded. But so then babysitter didn't want to babysit. And my parents didn't want to, you know, stick around. So they asked me to babysit. And my siblings were excellently behaved around me because I watched what my parents did to wind them up. And I did the opposite. And I watched my parents' volatility and manipulatabil manipulatability and I was solid. And I rewarded my siblings for being present and honest and didn't give them any perks for doing their act out. So they very rapidly became healthy kids within about 30 minutes of the adrenaline calming down and my parents leaving the house. My parents would come back and they would be upset that everything was so peaceful and effective. And so they would give the little cues of you know dissatisfaction and then my siblings would remember their role and start you know my sister would start criticizing my brother would start acting out my other one would have tantrums the other one would you know start making chatter etc and i would retreat to my room and so that's how i understood very clearly that this was not uh, an issue with the children this was an issue with the parents however not a single grown-up around was interested in that perspective because that perspective sheds light on the cult and on themselves. Whereas the idea that parenting is just hard because it's hard, has nothing to do with the cult, has nothing to do with us, is, uh, is a, a threatening one because it shifts the responsibility back to the, the, the parents and the grown-ups. Now, around this time, I was working with the channel Lazarus, and my parents were into creating your own reality and different New Age topics. They didn't actually uh, apply them, you know, in terms of creating a great marriage or relationship with their kids or anything. Um, 
but nonetheless, I was exposed to this. Now, this whole focus on being positive and having a positive attitude is one of the strong drives, you know, in you know different New Age circles. Um, but this added to the sense that there was something wrong with me because I felt despair, because I felt pain, because I felt depressed, because I felt suicidal. But in New Age circles, you're supposed to have a positive mental attitude and take the initiative and in all of this. Um, but nobody bothers breaking that down you know, to the child level and saying, well, to some extent, when you're a grown up and when people will actually listen to you rather than tell you to listen to your parents, then there's some use for this. So in the context of new age, be positive, I felt more unlovable and more cynical and bitterness um, and more of a sense like you want an actor who's pretending that this is all wonderful. It's wonderful to watch for wonderful, healthy children deteriorate into madness. Wonderful. Let's look on the bright side. Um, you know, they're, they're not dead yet. Um, and so you don't want the truth. You want your veneer is a lot of the sense there. So there's a bitterness, but there's also the awareness that nobody likes bitterness. So deepening sense of unlovability, but also some anger. There's some anger. It's like, you fuckers, you're too fucking cowardly to drink the medicine you've brewed and concocted in a thousand different ways. And rather than admit that you don't know what you're doing, you want everyone to lie to you. You want me to lie to you so that you can feel better. Because you don't want to feel like you're a fuck up, but you are a fuck up. And you don't want the evidence before you. And so what you'd like to do is then bribe me not to tell you about it. You don't want to hear it. What you want to hear is how wonderful you are. But this is not wonderful. It's suicidal painful. So this persona here comes on in a cult. You see, this has never been loved. No one looks at this 15-year-old and says, gosh, I wish I could hold and love that boy. He did nothing wrong. He's a wonderful boy. You know, of course he's bitter. Let's get it all out. And I admit, I'm an incompetent grown-up, and so were they, and this and that and the other, and we still don't know what we're doing. But boy, does that adolescent know the truth. No one's ever done that. Instead, they've looked the other way, said they're busy. They don't like bitter people. Cynicism is bad. Have a positive attitude. And so that's what he feels, seething, alone, shunted off into the corner. Uh, and for a while, you know, my mother waited for me to outgrow my distaste of relating to her. And my biggest distaste was that after all of this pain and layer upon layer of the wound, my experience of my mother was that she would like me to lie and pretend that none of that happened that she was wonderful and it's all over and done with. But the reality is every one of the children is carrying long, lingering scars at a high enough intensity that three of us feel suicidal from time to time. Yeah, you know, I've gotten very close to examining methods, uh, and it turns out two of my brothers have as well. Um, so, yeah. I'm not interested in lying about the past so you can feel great about abusing us and not feel bad about it so that you can live in the delusion of how wonderful uh, your incompetence was. I'm, I'm not, I don't have to rub it in your face, but don't call me up and try and drag what you want to hear out of it when it has nothing to do with how I feel. You want, as the last message of 
worthlessness and invisibility. You want me to s pretend that I don't exist so that you can feel a little better with the fantasy that you wanted me to be. And that creates bitterness and cynicism in a way that is not welcome. You'll even find, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll go online and see dating profiles by women that say, if you don't have a good relationship with your mother, I'm not interested. It's like, well, if you were around and were able to stop my mother from hurling me on the ground, perhaps that would be an easy possibility. I'd like a great relationship with an actual mother. Unfortunately, systemic trauma doesn't produce great relationships with anyone. And you're also blaming the child rather than saying something like, if your mother, if you're a good person and your mother doesn't have a good relationship with you, I'll have nothing to do with your mother because I don't support child abuse. You see how it's flipped repeatedly over and over again? The psychologist that my parents hired to analyze the symptoms of trauma did a very good analytical analysis of all of my symptoms and put it into nice psychological speak. The only thing missing from the analysis was the cause. It never occurs to psychologists to write a report about the family environment and the culture. But since the child is a fractal representation of the family culture and the larger culture, isn't the child a mirror for what's going on in the hearts, minds, and bodies of the parents, the grown-ups, and the larger cult? So why is the report about the child when the child in a childlike state will copy anything? You know, it wasn't an accident that at four years old, one of my first memories was of sociopathically turning my sister from tears to laughter, tears to laughter, tears to, to laughter. I wasn't aware of what I was doing until I looked at my father watching me. And I was aware of myself through his eyes, and he was not protecting my sister. He was watching me as a mirror of what he did. And I was copying without even having names for it what was done to me. Do you want to blame a child for that at four years old? Or do you want to question a cult or yourself for choosing to have kids without learning anything about healthy psychology, without talking to someone like myself? Seems like one good thing to include in the curriculum of competent parenting, talk with severely abused children that are honest and highly articulate. It's a start. Nobody has asked. You know, you can only get so far in a don't ask, don't tell cult. And that's what we have. So in the feeling of shame and unlived unlovability that no one is loving me, I withdrew more in pain. I knew my bitterness and cynicism made me more unlovable. I knew it was a sin in the New Age dogma. Uh, and nobody was sh showing up, and I didn't feel like exposing myself in that bitterness would help. So, you know, I had one quasi-confident, but I just stopped pointing out the cruelty and negativity of my parents to her because it made her uncomfortable. So the child is taking care of not only the parents, but the other grown-ups who feel uncomfortable listening to the child talk about their abuse. So how much loneliness do you need to induce to a child? How many messages do you need to give a child 
that you come secondary to every single grown-up in the cult, and that your deepest suicidal pain is secondary to my discomfort, my realization that I don't know what I'm doing. How many adults need to give that to a child before they feel utterly, completely alone and that they have little or no value? Well, how about all of them? Every single one of them give that message in their body, fidgeting, oh, I've, got, I've got to go, I've got to go. I've got to escape these feelings. I've got to escape reality by keeping busy. You know, it's our main addiction as a cult. I hurt, feel tired, addict, lash out because the veneer over all of this is this is all for your good. We're all wishing you well. This is a wonderful family, a wonderful cult, a wonderful uh, school system. It's all wonderful, right? And that's too painful to call this amount of pain wonderful. So there's lashing out, feeling lonely. And I try and control things. This is, you know, I'm completely out of control in a lot of things. So I try and control things and I give up. You know, I try, but, you know, it's it doesn't work. There's, you know, one thing after another, falls through my fingers. It, the, the cult does not cooperate in transparency. It doesn't cooperate in empathy. It doesn't cooperate in standing up for the child. So I try and control things. Now, one of the things that I developed around this time because I couldn't have safe relationships with human beings is I developed very meticulous relationships with objects. So. Um, What we do is when we induce these amounts of fear in people, we then pathologize the symptoms of a dysfunctional cult. So this inability to control feelings or relationships with the need to have a sense of agency and learn regulation meant that I became far more possessive and protective about objects. And I didn't feel good if I walked into my room and saw something moved because it meant someone had been in there without my permission. It meant that I had no control over anything. Now, in a pathological cult, this coping mechanism of powerlessness becomes itself not honored. Like, gosh, Good thing you were smart enough at six years old to understand that you needed to have agency in order to develop. You needed to have some control of something to learn regulation skills. You had unregulated, chaotic parents in an unregulated and chaotic house with volatile emotions, volatile boundaries. You couldn't learn regulation about anything, but thank God you figured out that you could control things, that staplers didn't lie, that staplers punch staples repeatedly. They always did the same thing. It was wonderful. And so you formed stability in your relationship to objects that a healthy family would have made possible by having stable relationships. But you see, in a cult like ours, with the scapegoating on the individual, this then gets pathologized as you have Asperger's syndrome rather than we have traumatic dissociative cultism and leave our kids to clean up the mess. You have obsessive compulsive disorder rather than we have dissociative identity schizophrenia that induces overcompensation as a way to regulate and find balance between being out of control and helpless and having some sense of control. So, you know, that screen just turned off. And I didn't want it to, but it's been a while and it just turned off. So, you know, but it also didn't give me a lecture 
when I turned it on again, because it's a thing rather than a parent. And so I became more obsessive with things as a way of compensating that. But that also, because I link then my safety to having things be a certain way, I'm more prickly to be around today because I get upset when things are not where they should be, i.e., I feel out of control, overwhelmed, and helpless when I map out things and other people engage with them, and then the things get, you know, put in the wrong spaces, and then I have no control because I never had control with feelings, I never had control with people, and now I have no control with anything because people are just putting the pieces wrong. So I immediately have to you know, put these back, and then I get upset that nobody cares about this. You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times I just got a divorce about this because the woman I married deteriorated uh, in, the, in the marriage to being unreliable to do anything organized at all. It didn't matter what the thing was, she would forget to do this, and then she would forget to do that. Oh, oh, I see, you have a bad memory. So make a list. But then the very next day, she wouldn't look at the list. So go look at the list. I don't, I don't want to. So then do the things on the list. I forgot, right? Well, this is an insult, meaning I feel terrified that the one thing I have any control over, my house, you know, the, the thing, is constantly thrown into chaos by somebody who doesn't understand in a psychologically illiterate cult, that that's my one little bit of order that is my friend. My one area that I feel sane is that things never lie and do what they're supposed to be doing and are in the same place. So, you know, I just gave away a bicycle that I'd had for 20 years in excellent condition. I got it at age 12. I gave it away at age 45. I like the familiarity of things. Things don't lie and betray me. But I don't like the desperation, the tremendous discomfort that I feel when somebody violates what my mind says, well, it's just a thing. That's a human being. But this is just a thing. But it's not just a thing for me. It's a reference point to sanity and order that ties in with biological links at a time when in my life, those were the only things that were sane and the only things that I had any control over. And as soon as I lost that, I felt despair and helplessness and suicidal. And I want someone to understand that. But in a traumatically illiterate cult, nobody says, oh, you're very attractive. I'd like to date you. Could you explain your traumatic triggers? Because I'd like our relationship to last uh, rather than stomping on them every single day for a few years until uh, the relationship needs to end because it's too traumatically triggering. How about that? Would that be intelligent? Well, it's certainly not American. So, you know, these things have a long shelf life of ripple effects in a cult that continually shames the individual each step of the way for demonstrating the symptoms induced by their cult. Now, we're kind of on the 16th ring here of our kind of build up of this pathological model. 
that is the adaptive identity, the adapt constantly iterating identity because you've got to find something that survives in this ecology, this cult ecology. So all that is left then for me is to worry, to feel small, to feel unloved, unhappy, and unlovable, and to reproach the cult and the parents for leaving me there, uh, lovers for not touching and loving this place. Now I can put on an act as good as the next person and be loved for the act, but wouldn't it be nice to be loved for the part that needed the most love, that was the most terrified, rather than to be disdained and disgustedly rejected for having the audacity to tell the, pr the truth that there are terrified, lonely, unloved parts in a terrified, lonely, and sociopathic cult. And also feeling disgusted at myself for not wanting to live, for not wanting to succeed, or to try and accomplish anything. I don't deserve it. I'm not worth it. I won't do it. I will fail. I will freeze. I will wait to be hit. In response to all this, so that's, you know, there, I feel rage and want to hit something. See, this is how intergenerational abuse patterns. It's so terrifying and scary, waiting to be hit and having the inner voice of a seven-year-old say, I'm bad, the good thing to do is to stand here and be hit. And another part saying, I can't take it. Please get me out of here. And the seven-year-old saying, no, that would be bad. A good boy takes the punishment that he deserves. So every hit becomes a reference point that I must deserve that amount of pain or it wouldn't be happening. So I must be really bad. So then I don't deserve to be happy and have a successful emotional life. Oh, sure, you can have lots of money, you can have lots of sex, as long as it doesn't feel amazing because you deserve to be in pain. As long as you're still there in the terror and loneliness of that chronic clenching, it never lets go. So I will fail, freeze, and wait to be hit. That's still there as a very loud part in the voting mechanism for what happens. I cannot then rely on myself to defend myself from severe chronic abuse, because then I believe I'm bad, and I'll be unloved, and that's worse. I'll be ostracized, and that's worse than being hit. Now, in response to that, I feel intense rage, uh, hatred, you know, and want to hit something or someone. I want to, I want to beat the shit out of something rather than just wait there to be hit. So this is why I haven't had a child. I've been surrounded by morons that are dishonest and psychologically incompetent. Why would I have learned anything competent from them? And if I can't release the original terror and I'm reactive around that, how would I not give that to a two-year-old if that terror came up and the child needs to scream? I don't have any answer for that. So I have no children and no plans to have children.